tonight, Mr. Jim Lewers. Um, Jim is recently retired from a 42-year career in the museum field, having served at Landis Valley Museum, Daniel Boone Homestead, Conrad Weiser Homestead, and the Effort of Cloister. Uh, he's a scholar of Pennsylvania German architecture and is well acquainted with the Ole Valley. Uh, let's give Jim a warm welcome as he presents the Coffin Farm of the Old Valley. Thank you very much. <laughs> some of you know me. I see some familiar faces here. Um, so today is full moon, right? Is it, it's kind of cool. I got to tell you, all day some poltergeist has been following me around. So uh, just bear with me tonight. Uh, I will try not to fumble too much or knock things over, but uh, uh, it's been an interesting, interesting day. <laughs> so. I want to go over a couple, before we start into the slides, and basically what we're going to be doing here, it's a little bit cold to, uh, to be walking around the Crossman House and Farm uh, this evening, so we are going to do a walking tour of the surviving buildings indoors, right? That's what this is. We're going to do a walking tour, not quite yet, so you can keep the lights on for now. Uh, I'll, I'll, let, I'll, I'll give you the... Apparently we're not picking up your best side on film here, so... Okay. <laughs> So I'll, 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 let, I'll give you the I'll give you the word and we'll, we'll start. Um, I don't think I have to uh, uh, plug the Only Valley to to you folks. I'm sure you all know uh, how important this region is. I will say that as a historian, and this is almost blasphemous, right? Sometimes we overuse the term significant, right? So then, when we when we really have a really a really significant, you know, building or area we want to talk about, how do you differentiate that from all the other significant places, you know? And that's the problem we have when we talk about the Olney Valley. Because literally, from Maine to Georgia, there was not another place in rural colonial America like the Olney Valley. And I tell this to people, and they don't believe me, but in fact, it is true. And, you know, the Oley Valley in the 18th century was more than Oley Township. It really was a region that encompassed both Oley Township, Exeter Township, and, and Amity Township. And, you know, if today we went to Philadelphia and walked down Market Street and asked people, how you get to Ole, they wouldn't know what we were talking about, right? But if you walked in Market Street in the old city in 1750, they would know what we were talking about and where to send us. Ole was a very dynamic and significant place in colonial Pennsylvania. Um, and in addition to being a great dynamic place, it was a place with incredible diversity. And when you, when you look at the three township area, and you look at the, at the people who were living here by the mid 18th century with descendants of Swedes and Holland Dutch and English and Welsh and Scots Irish, German and Swiss settlers, of course, uh, maybe a, a smattering of people descended from French Huguenots and others, uh, Native Americans, free blacks, and black slaves, uh, as many as. 12 different religious groups practicing by the mid-18th century, and a diversity of economy in addition to all these different people, where you had certainly agriculture, but also trades of all different kinds thriving here. Um, industry, uh, mills like water-powered grist mills, saw mills, a flaxseed mill, a paper mill, uh, iron furnaces and forges, uh, and even uh, commercial outposts like the store that George Douglas ran, and the store in Amityville, uh, and other places like that. So it was a very diverse region. And literally, uh, within Pennsylvania, the only other location that came close to that diversity was the port of Philadelphia. But if you, if you wanted to compare uh, other rural areas of colonial America to only, you would not find another region like it anywhere. And certainly within Pennsylvania, it was the embodiment of what William Penn had in mind uh, when he created his province. So this region was an incredible place, and on top of all that history, 
uh, we have within this three township area today uh, the preservation of some incredible places, uh, landscapes, uh, the built environment, uh, and, and history. So this is truly a special, a, a special place, uh, unlike any other. And, and so when I say that Oli is significant, again, how do you compare it to other significant places? But I give it a higher level of significance. So within Oli, you know, what's the best place in Oli? Right? What's the best place in Oli? Well, uh, there are have been scholars and people in the past who have pointed, in fact, to the Kaufman Farm as one of the most important places within this important region. Um, some of you folks know the name G. Edward Brumbaugh, who was a, 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 a really pioneer landscape architect uh, who, who worked on a lot of, uh, of state buildings. He restored the David Homestead and a number of buildings at Valley Forge and Washington Crossing, the Ephraim Cloister, uh, Pottsgrove Manor, many, many other places. He also restored uh, the early chapel of St. Gabriel's Church and some other, some other places. Uh, G. Edwin Brumbaugh, in his landmark book on Pennsylvania German architecture, called the Kaufman Farm the most complete Pennsylvania German farm. And, uh, and, and, and I don't know if that's quite true or not, uh, but it was, he, certainly, he certainly thought that the Kaufman Farm was a very, very important place. And, and um, I think that with, within Ole, I think you'd be hard pressed to find you know, other, other places that are as important as, as the Kaufman Farm. Um, the Kaufman Farm, though, is both unique and representative. And you know, in some, in some ways, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more important than some of its parts. Um, for the last couple of years, I've gotten involved with uh, the friends of the Kaufman Farm, and so I've gotten to, 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 to look at the buildings a little closer than I had in the past. And, you know, are, are, there, are there better barns in Ole than the barns on the Kaufman Farm? Well, maybe, you know. Um, are, there, are there better spring houses? Well, maybe. Um, is there a better ancillary building? Well, maybe. Uh, is there a better main farmhouse? Well, that's, that's debatable, but, but again, sometimes you're, you're comparing apples to oranges. Uh, so I think that you can, you, can, you can look at farms in Ole, and you can look at farms certainly within the Pennsylvania German sub-region, and maybe find individual buildings which are quote unquote better than the buildings on the Kaufman farm, but taken as a group, taken as a, as, as, as a set, uh, you would be hard pressed to find another farm in Ole or elsewhere in the Pennsylvania German region that measures up to, to the Kaufman farm. It's a, it's a great place. Uh, and of course, it's got an incredible uh, family history as well. The Kaufman family uh, owned the property for only 271 years. <laughs> So that, that in itself is, is, is really quite, quite a mark. Um, now, there won't be any tests on the Kaufman family, right? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to run through really briefly some of the high points. Uh, and and, I, will, and I, will, I will say this, that um, the information that I have on, on the Kaufmans and the dates comes from the survey that was completed by Phoebe Hopkins, and she based her survey on a, on a lot of original land documents and what have you. I have not myself personally read all of that documentation. So if, if, if I mention a date and somebody says, no, wait, that's wrong, uh, and Phoebe Hopkins was a dear friend of mine, and I, and I, and I knew her many, many years, and I, and I, and I miss her, uh, but blame Phoebe. You don't like the dates, okay? <laughs> Sorry, Phoebe. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, is uh, is Joe Mitchell here? Joe Mitchell. Uh, we we've kind of emailed back and forth. Uh, I have not had an opportunity to look at the information and all the documentation you're compiling, but but Joe is compiling a lot of documentary information on the farm. I can't wait to maybe we can talk some time and. Uh, and take a look at uh, what you've compiled. Uh, it's great to, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to look at the buildings and look at the architecture, but to really understand the buildings, you really have to look at the people who live there. And, 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 the, and the family history uh, is so very important in understanding the structures. 
And so as we kind of go through the farm today and kind of look at the buildings, um, there, I'm going to have some questions. And, 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 and maybe by looking at some of the documentary evidence, wills and, and, and maybe estate inventories and things like that going forward, maybe we'll, we'll be able to understand uh, and answer some of these questions you know, in, in, in the future. But uh, I can't say that I have personally looked at all the documentation. So I'm going to, that's my, that's my excuse, okay? <laughs> so if we look at the, at the Kaufmans, um, you know, David Kaufman uh, was, uh, was, as far as we can tell, the original owner first Kaufman of the farm, uh, at least by 1726, who apparently owned the property till his death in 1762. Now, after David, it's really easy, right? Because there are three Jacobs in a row. <laughs> Jacob the first, Jacob the second, and Jacob the third. Um, I ended my career at Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum. Uh, and uh, the Landis family was a big important part of Landis Valley because they owned a lot of the land there. All the Landises were named Henry, right? Well, all the Kaufmans were named Jacob, right? Um, if I call somebody Jacob Landis or Henry Kaufman, just forgive me because sometimes those names are just kind of embedded in my, in my, in my brain here. But, so David, David was there until 1762. He was the earliest settler. Um, perhaps, perhaps one of the buildings that stands today, part of the old barn, may remain from David's time. Right? The other buildings that David built are most likely gone. It was probably an early settler's house. Uh, there might have been an early bake oven. There might have been an early spring house. Uh, there may have been other agricultural buildings. But uh, David was David was the first Kaufman, and uh, he died 1762. So after David is who? Jacob. Jacob. <laughs> Jacob the first. Okay, good. You're with me. I'm glad you're with me here. So Jacob the first. Jacob the first owned the property. These are not his the, the dates he lived. These are the dates that he owned the property. He owned the property from 1762 until his death in 1804. So essentially the second half of the 18th century. And Jacob I built some, I believe, some very significant buildings. Jacob would have built the first part of the main house. And I believe Jacob built several of the other early standing buildings that we'll talk about, right? So Jacob was there 1762 to 1804. The next owner, of the property was Jacob Kaufman, right? <laughs> Jacob the second. So Jacob the second owned the property from 1804 until 1843, roughly the first half of the 19th century. And he was a very busy guy. I believe that he built some very important buildings, including, I believe, and some people may disagree, but I believe he built the two main barns that stand on the property today, uh, and maybe a couple of the other buildings that, sta that stand as well. Jacob the Col Jacob II was a, an important person, uh, 1804 to 1843. Following his death, the next owner of the property was Jacob, Jacob Kaufman, right? Jacob III, all right. So Jacob III, owned the property from 1843 until his death in 1852. He was a relatively young man when he died. And uh, his son, uh, Frank, right? <laughs> sorry, his son Frank was only five uh, when he quote unquote inherited the property. Um, when he, uh, and this is according to the, to the documents from the, the survey, uh, when he reached majority, which I assume is 21, he moved into the town of Oli. And very possibly, his uncle Isaac continued to then farm the property, who owned an adjoining farm. Right? And in fact, from this point on, the Kaufmans who owned the property weren't living there farming. And from about this point on, there most likely were tenant farmers farming the property. 
as opposed to you know, family living in the house, farming and living there, right? And, and really that's up to the current day, right? So from about you know, the mid 19th century until now, you've had farming operations which were, were, was a tenancy, okay? Which is probably why there wasn't a whole lot of modernization. It's probably why the main house wasn't renovated. It's probably why a lot of the barns weren't renovated. You know, when you go through those, those larger, the, especially the larger dairy barn, it's kind of the way it was you know, maybe in the 1850s or 60s. You know, where's the, where's the milking parlor? Where's the, where are the things that, that, that dairy farmers had to install because of, you know, hygiene? <laughs> they don't, they're not there, right? You're not there the, the way you see on other working dairy farms. Yeah? So the idea of, of, of perhaps this tradition of tenant farm uh, operation um, might be res kind of responsible for the fact that we, the, the preservation of the, of the buildings and the fact that you don't have a lot of different constructions on site. Um, following, following Frank Kaufman, uh, as far as I can tell, the, uh, the property uh, then went to uh, two brothers, Donald C. Kaufman and Roger Kaufman. Um, following, uh, and following them, uh, the farm went to uh, uh, David B. Kaufman, who is the son of Donald, and also uh, Marguerite Kaufman, who is the son of Roger. Uh, David B. Kaufman was the last Kaufman to own the property. He died in 1997. From 1998 till uh, about two months ago, the property was owned by two incredible individuals who I, who I won't name because they don't want to be named, but they have uh, done an incredible amount of work to preserve this farm for us today. And I won't say another word. They're you know, very special. Um, and uh, again, 2019, uh, the Friends of the Kaufman Farm uh, actually now hold title to this property. Uh, but that's it. There's a lot of Kaufmans, a lot of Kaufmans in there. And again, um, I look forward to really looking at a lot of the other documentation on the Kaufmans and, and, uh, and what have you. But uh, that's sort of the Kaufman story. Um, now, the original tract uh, that David Kaufman acquired and, and has kind of amassed, we believe, uh, ended up about, about 370 acres. Though, again, I haven't got all the documentation, and I'd like to do that to confirm that. Um, in 1750, that acreage was bounded by some really important names in Old uh history. Uh, by, by 1750, there were the Schenkels, the Greesemers, the Leshers, the Byers, the Lees, the Bertolets, and the Fishers owned land adjoining uh, that Kaufman property. So, I remember I mentioned that Jacob Kaufman II, very important, he was the guy who owned the property the second half of the 19th century. In 1832, and his name was actually Jacob, Jacob Hill Kaufman, we'll call him Jacob II though. Jacob Hill Kaufman built the second Kaufman farm. So if you're familiar with the Kaufman farm on Kaufman Road, uh, you're heading west past the Kaufman farm. There's a second Kaufman farm. It was built by Jacob II in 1832. And the house, in fact, has the 1832 date stem on it. Two years later, in 1834, he added another section to the main house of the original Kaufman farm. Right? And I believe that when he did that, he and his wife moved in to that addition as a retirement apartment. I believe that Jacob II in 1834 said, I've had it, right? And he allowed Jacob III to live in the old Kaufman house and farm that part of the property. And he then allowed his son Isaac to occupy the 1832 house and farm that end of the property. And when Jacob died, the farm was split, giving us now 120 acres in the 
earlier farmstead and with the other farm um, with 250 acres. So the farms were split uh, in the 19th century. And uh, building that retirement apartment and moving in and allowing your sons to farm those other properties before their death was not uncommon at all. That was very common. And it was a way that a farmer could retire, set his sons up, retain ownership, but not do the work. <laughs> and uh, we believe that's, that was, and that's a very, very important part of, of the history of the farm. So before we get to the slides, a couple, a couple of general statements here. First of all, um, we talk about the dates of these buildings. Um, they can be debatable. You know, we know that in 1832, uh, Jacob II built that other house because there's a date stone on it that says 1832. Right? And we know that in 1834, the retirement apartment was built because I believe there's an 1834 date on that piece of the property. But the other dates are sort of, you know, you know, we call we call the main house 1763. Well, there's actually a tile with 1763 inscribed in it. Is that hard proof that the house was built in 1763? I don't know. What about 1764, 1762 and a half? You know. So we use these dates and we assign dates, but they can be debatable. It's one of the things about historians. We can change our mind. I remember, uh, you know. You know, talks that I did 20 years ago, you know, I come to, to make some changes. Right? So, so sometimes as you as you acquire new information, you change things. So when we throw out dates, they're sort of rough. They're, they're an estimate, and uh, it isn't it isn't too often that you can actually be really hard and fast with the date of construction. They're more of an estimate. Um, the buildings. That, were, that, that survived today on the farm, and this pretty much goes through most of the period buildings, 18th and 19th century buildings you're gonna see throughout Oldie today, were, were, were built by professionals, built by professional house rights or, or, or barn rights, uh, so that it wasn't like the settler went out there with, a, with an ax and built his own house. Uh, these were professionally built structures, and I will say that we know a lot about the 18th and 19th century. One of the things we are not really sure about, however, is the relationship between the owner or the, or the, the person who owns the property and the professionals who are building the structure. There most likely was a, a lead person or the general contractor who you dealt with who then brought in all kinds of different professionals, stone masons, rough carpenters, finished carpenters, plasterers, blacksmiths, other people, tilers, or brick makers, right? And, and you had to coordinate all those different trades. When we look at a building as complex as the main house on the Kaufman farm, I can guarantee that before the first spade full of dirt was uncovered to, for the excavation of that cellar, they knew exactly what that house was going to look like. They knew how large it was going to be. They knew how many windows there were going to be in that house and where they're going to be located. They knew that they knew where the chimney was going to be and, and how the flues were going to be set up. They, they knew everything about that house. They knew that there was going to be a barrel arch under part of the cellar. They all that had to be known ahead of time. Right? You can't wait till the house is half done and then come over and say, "Hey, by the way, I, can you put a barrel arch under that kitchen?" You know. <laughs> No. <laughs> so these buildings, whether they were barns or spring houses or whatever, were built by professionals. Uh, and there's a certain relationship between the, the owner and the professional. We know the number of buildings that are standing today on the Kaufman farm, but we really don't know how many other buildings existed at one point and, and have disappeared. Some, have, some There's been some excavation and some some cellars have been uncovered, but we really don't know how many buildings stood there. Um, did everybody know where the, uh, uh, where the Hope Mill stood along Boyer Road? Anybody? Okay. The road that you go back towards the Kime House? 
right at that interesting triangle, there's an interesting group of buildings. There's the ground barn that was the Casper Mall barn, and then there's part of what had been Hope Mill, and there's a house there. There's like three or four buildings there. Well, in the 1880s, uh, an itinerant uh, kind of artist named, named Brader did a large format pencil drawing of that complex. And when I was at Landis Valley, because we had a couple of Braders, we were involved in a big exhibit in Canton, Ohio, of Brader drawings. And I happened to see the drawing of that complex. Again, today, there are about four or five buildings. In 1882, there were about 30 buildings at that complex. Almost all of them were gone. And they included log buildings, 18th century structures, obviously, that are gone, disappeared. Right? So we don't know how many buildings once stood on the Coffin Farm and are gone. Right? All we know is what's there now and some of the excavation uh, that, that was done uncovering some of the basements and cellars. Um, really, really briefly, you know, the Coffins were Pennsylvania Germans. It's important to understand, however, that the assimilation of the Germans happened within the first generation. So that you can't look at the Coffin buildings and say, oh, these are all German buildings. So that's, that's important to understand. That assimilation happened very, very quickly. The other thing is that the economics of agriculture changed from the 18th century into the 19th century. And just as today, economics were pivotal in phases of construction. And when you had a, a large amount of buildings being built at a particular time, it's probably because there was money to be made, right? And so the economics of agriculture had a great impact on the, on the buildings at the Kaufman Farm, as well as buildings throughout uh, the Oli Valley and Oli, Oli Township and, and elsewhere. Okay. Okay, well, I guess I'm done. <laughs> no, I guess we can actually go to the, let's go to the slides here. Okay. And I'm uh, going to works here. All I have to do is press the right button. Way down. There you All right. So here we go. Here's an overall overview. Right? We're looking straight down here at Coffman Road. Right? Here's Coffman Bridge Road. Maybe that's Snyder Road, I guess. And here you have the Coffman Farm, uh, 120 acres uh, that we're, we're really talking about today. And here is the upper farm that was owned, that became the uh, Isaac Coffman property. Uh, and, uh, and this is pretty much uh, kind of, if you're looking down, pretty much in the middle of the tract of land. Um, here is the uh, main Kaufman house, and here's a kind of a close-up view of, of, of this grouping of buildings. Today, or this evening, we're pretty much going to be talking about this group of buildings right here. Uh, there are a couple other built features that we're not going to be talking about, and that includes the family graveyard, which is up here in this corner of this hill. And there are also some features on this side of Kaufman Road. Uh, there's a lime kiln over here. There's an ice house over here. And um, Jeffrey, what else is over there? There's a, there's a quarry there. There's a quarry. Uh, so there are a number of features over here uh, that I really don't want to be talking about. Incidentally, uh, if you, those of you who have driven by and probably have seen the graveyard up on top of the hill, this is a long distance, by the way. It's a, lot to, it's a steeper, longer walk than you might think. Because the cemetery wall looks like it's a knee-high wall, but it's not. It kind of comes up to your shoulder. So it's a it's a hike up to the cemetery, but located whereby both these families, of course, could use it for their, for their burials. So here's a more close-up view of uh, of the Coffman property, and and here is the main house, right? And everybody see kind of this trace here, right? This is probably the location of the original log house built by David Kaufman uh, in maybe, the, maybe the, even the 17 teens. Uh, there was some uh, excavation, uh, archaeological excavation done here a few years ago, but that's most likely where that building, where that building stood. And so this, is, this tends to be where the earliest built environment exists. And most likely the house was built on this part of the, the big property because there's a very good spring flowing here, as you can see. 
Uh, and there was probably the location. Yes, Jeff. I just want to mention the uh, uh, the square brick that's up on the table uh, was um, indicated to be excavated from that uh, original, let's say, building or that that uh, foundation that Jim pointed out. That, that's, if you haven't seen it, come up and see it. It's really, really cool. It's really great. There may have been some other early buildings which no longer exist. Uh, you know, that were associated with the log house. I think there was an early spring house and an earlier bake oven. Uh, this is uh, an early barn, which actually st probably started as a, a stone and log barn that burnt uh, the 1890s and was kind of rebuilt. But so that this is the one structure that now exists on site, which might date from the, uh, the day of the call for the period. Uh, this, of course, uh, this is the western portion of the, the property, the eastern portion. These buildings more or less face south, uh, which, is, uh, which is not unusual, unless we need German farmsteads. But uh, this is the overall you know, setting for this, group of, for this group of buildings. And again, uh, here is the, uh, here's the, our, our, the Kaufman Farm property that we're going to be talking about tonight. And this is the Isaac Kaufman property uh, up, up here. Okay. a couple of general views, uh, and this is uh, looking uh, to the west, and this is the, uh, the, main, the main house, uh, the Kaufman House, and uh, it's a spring house, and a building that I'm going to call the ancillary building. Uh, this is sometimes called the stone cabin. I'm calling it an ancillary building because I think it was used for, for multiple functions. But you get a sense of these buildings um, kind of organized in a way. Okay, they all face south. Uh, for generally speaking, the roof lines are, you know, parallel with one another. Most of the buildings are either, or roof lines are either parallel or perpendicular. And, you know, I think uh, it might be the, the, the German heritage. We're kind of we're used to this border on the landscape, right? You know, the, these buildings aren't just kind of thrown there willy-nilly. Uh, they all kind of line up in straight lines. I think probably if we gave everybody, like, uh, uh, 10 uh, square building blocks, and said, arrange them some way, everybody would arrange them in a straight line, right? Or, or some, some uh, relationship of parallel or perpendicular, uh, as opposed to just kind of thrown on the landscape. We take, that, we take this order you know, for granted. We have, uh, but I think when you look at a farm like, like this, and look at these buildings, and see that they are, in fact, arranged uh, in, in some orderly pattern. They, they tend to be, uh, you know, again, we, we take this kind of for granted, and yet, uh, it's something to note. Now, this is uh, kind of from the back of the main uh, coffee farm looking to the east. Uh, and this is that ancillary building. You're looking out towards the line of agricultural buildings and these larger barns in the eastern portion. Again, did you get a sense of the fact that the roof lines are in an orderly either parallel or, or perpendicular to, to one another? And uh, you know, from uh, from Coffin Road, uh, looking sort of toward the northeast, again there's that ancillary building, the Spring House, and you're looking now at the, the, the two main barns, this, this stone barn kind of by the road, the big dairy barn up here, and these other agricultural buildings. So basically, you've got you know the earlier buildings in the eastern section of the property today. You've got these these barns up here, and the uh, I'm sorry, the, the earlier buildings in the western end of the property. Uh, these two barns on the eastern end of the property, and then in between, sort of a line of, of kind of these later agricultural structures. Okay, so here we are looking at the main house. Uh, and again, we're assigning a date of 1763 to the early part of this house. This house was built in two sections. So you have the main house that kind of comes over here, and then you have a 19th century section to the far left, and we'll, we'll see that better in another, another slide. Uh, but here's this main house, and uh, got the center chimney in the middle here. Um, travelers in Pennsylvania in the 18th century said that you can tell uh, a German house from an English house because the German houses, chimneys rise up in the middle, of, and that's, that's sort of the, the case. Uh, you know, uh, but this house is a great example of uh, a mid-18th century Pennsylvania German uh, traditional farmhouse. 
Um, and, and, and it was based on the types of houses that these people would have known in the Rheinfels, in the, in the Platinum, where they, where they came from. Um, and behind the main house, of course, you've got the main oven and this other outbuilding back here. Uh, but here is, the, here is this main house, with a fairly sharp roof line, um, and uh, the, center, the center chimney. Um, and the door is off to the hook, better, a better view of the, of the actual front of the house. But you got to get a sense of the, of the scale of this building. Uh, and, and again, uh, a building like this would have been built by a professional. And as I said earlier, before they took the first shovel spade of, of dirt uh, to, to excavate this foundation, they would have known what this house would have looked like and, and what the building components would have been. In the front here, you can see. Okay, you can see here where there was the archaeological excavation, where that first perhaps log settler's house stood. Um, uh, how many people here have ever seen the Bertlett Log House at the Danegood Homestead? Any people? Okay, that is probably the type of house which stood here. That is a common early German settler's house. It's most likely the type of house that stood here. And uh, the, 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 the kitchen in a house like that, as, as would have been the case with many of these center chimney houses, the, the kitchen floor was not excavated. And so this tile over here was probably the tile in the kitchen floor. So when you would have walked in, you could have probably would have walked on, the, on those tiles. <laughs> um, so let's go around the back. Here is the back of the main house. So again, the section to the left is the 1763 portion of the house. This is the 1834 edition uh, put on by Jacob II, right? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Jacob I, Jacob II, like the king of England. Uh, but you're looking at the back of the house, and you can really see the difference between the roof lines, and you can see the difference in these, these two sections of the house. Incidentally, um, it's possible that this window was originally a doorway. It's possible that there may have been some type of porchway or even gallery in the back of this house. Um, one theory is that perhaps uh, it was a way that they uh, loaded grain into the house for storage. There is a granary. Uh, there's a, a, a room that was identified as a granary on the second floor. Uh, that's a possibility, uh, but uh, I think further investigation is, is needed. But it is possible that there might have been some type of other porchway or even a gallery back here on the, on the second floor of this building. Um, uh, a gallery such as that exists on the Keim House. Uh, and, uh, and, and so if it's similar, uh, you might have had a similar situation uh, here. So this is the gable of that 1763 portion of the house. Again, looking here's the back. And, Here's the gable end. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, you have not only not one, but two openings up here in the attic level. And in fact, uh, this house had <coughs> up in the attic a double attic. So that, I actually bought this at a pet store. This, they use this you know, for cat exercise. You know, I wanted to make sure I had a pointer today. So, uh, <laughs> My, my, my son has a cat and lived with us for a year. We had one of these things, and after about five minutes, the cat figured it out. You know, you're like, I'm not going to go after that thing. It's just that thing in your hand. Anyway, so you can see that, uh, okay, you've got a window, but then you can see this closed opening up here. I believe that this accommodated a hoist uh, for raising grain and putting grain up here. So why would they do that? You know, why were they putting grain in the attic? Right. Well, first of all, it's important to understand that in the mid-18th century, we talk about the agricultural economy of the Only Valley, it was based on wheat. Right? Various grains were being grown on these farms, spelts, rye, other things, but wheat was the cash crop. So that wheat was being harvested, stored, ground into wheat flour, and then wagged to Philadelphia. Well, then what happened to it? Well, then what happened to it is that they sold it to wheat merchants. So what did the wheat merchants do with it? 
Well, remember, Philadelphia, uh, in addition to being a large city, second largest city in the British Empire in 1750, next to London, was also the major port in the colonies. That wheat flour was put on ships, and that wheat flour was sent to the Caribbean, and it was sent back to Europe, right? Because, you know, all those ships bringing people into Philadelphia, they weren't going back empty, right? Like, if you own an 18-wheeler in Reading, and you drive to LA, you're not driving that truck back empty, right? So those ships were going to Europe with goods produced in Pennsylvania. Flour that was grown on this farm, without a doubt, ended up in Europe as well as the Caribbean. Because in the Caribbean, um, they weren't growing wheat in Jamaica, were they? They were growing sugar. Right? <coughs> Pennsylvania wheat what was, what was feeding the slaves and the other people in the Caribbean. And people like the Kaufmans were making a lot of money on that. Right? So um, these addicts were a very, very stable and dry and secure place to store what was, you know, your money crop. And so we know, and we know that from a couple different reasons. Among others, we know that from, in fact, estate inventories, which talk about grain in the attic, wheat in the attic. Okay? So we know that that's where they stored their wheat. Yes? Don't you think that grain in the attic was the seed for the following year? Well, I some of it might have been, yes. Well, there's no doubt about it. Yes? They couldn't store a real whole lot of it. Right, but they did store pretty much. But I, I, you're, you're right. I think some of it was. You're absolutely right. I think some of it would have been seed for the next year, uh, but some of it was also what they would have, you know, would have been selling as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. There's also different qualities of flour. Yes. Levi Hollingsworth was the main merchant in Philadelphia. Uh huh. There were some that were made into ship bread. Uh huh. But the quality really made a difference to these people. Uh -huh. They yep. have like three different lay labels. Well, this, uh, as you can see the back of the house, you get, you get a sense of uh, the, the fenestration back here. And uh, again, that second opening. Uh, here is. Uh, So we're back to the front of the house, and this is we're now looking at the 1763 facade. And you'll notice that the chimney, the center chimney is here. You notice that uh, this facade is not symmetrical, it's asymmetrical. Uh, this door off to the side leads into the kitchen, which spans the entire width of the house, or the kuka. Uh, the chimney serves a huge fireplace, which opens into that kitchen. Of course, that would have been for cooking, for cooking the food. Uh, to the right of this house, and the, uh, to kind of behind the, 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 the chimney stack, this front room was called the Stuba, and uh, was an important room in the family. It was uh, kind of a large uh, public space. Um, it was uh, the dining room. It's where the family would have kept their best pieces of furniture. Um, and then behind it was a smaller room called the Commer which was usually the master bedroom. Um, the second floor of this house has uh, uh, actually four rooms, uh, two above the kuka, and two uh, to the right-hand side. What's really unusual about this house, though, is that uh, the room that is directly above the shuba, uh, rather than being sort of a traditional Pennsylvania German room, uh, was very much like a Georgian room. It was, it was very, very high style. And we're actually not quite sure what it was used for. Was it, in fact, the master bedroom for the family? We're not absolutely certain. But it was a very, very, it's, it's, it's a uh, kind of an unusual statement in a, in a German house of this period. Because you have a, a house that throughout is a very traditional Pennsylvania German farmhouse. But this room in the upper, this, this upper room, um, 
was a very, very high style, uh, really a Georgian interior, kind of more like the interior of the, of the Fisher House. It's a very, very unusual building. Um, uh, and I think really one of a kind. You know, there are several buildings in the Oli Valley that are large mid 18th century two story center chimney houses. You think about the Levan House and the Kime House and even the, the house in the, on the, the Abraham Bertlett House. Um, and, each, and yet each one of them is different. And uh, I know the Kime House very well because I'm on the board of the Preservation Trust which owns the, Kime, owns the Kime House. The Kime House was built about 10 years before this building. It is much, much different. So that each of these large buildings are sort of monumental and yet they were each, each kind of unique. Oh, you also note the uh, the bulkhead doors leading to the cellar. Um, beneath uh, the right-hand side of the house is a, is a full cellar, but also beneath the kuka is a, is a barrel-arched cellar as well. Uh, and it's very, very unusual to have the entire cellar essentially excavated in a house like this. It was more common for the area beneath the kuka uh, not to be excavated at, at, at all. So it's uh, it's a building with some incredible characteristics, and again, it's in some respects it is uh, representative of other great Pennsylvania German farmhouses. But in some other respects, it's, it's certainly very unique. Just a couple uh, close-up views of some of the original fabric on the house and, and some unusual features: this uh, uh, the, kind of the stone, uh, sandstone surround uh, cellar window. With uh, with grates on it, and uh, you know a view of one of the original original windows. There's a lot of the original fabric in this house, original original uh, window framing and, and other fabric. You also get a sense of the uh, of the pointing um, and and kind of the cut stone on the front of this building. Um, the, the, the the south facade uh, is the principal facade of this building, and and the stone was was, was kind of dressed and pointed. Uh, to, uh, uh, to kind of uh, give an impression of, of, of a full cut stone. It was, it was sort of putting your best, your best side forward, even though it's only across the road, but still, this was, this, was the, this was kind of the public face of this building. And just some other details of the, uh, uh, again, the, the, the stone work, the coin work, uh, and this uh, original hood over the door of the 1763 house. An incredible building, really. There's some really great uh, details and, and again, uh, original, original fabric. So this is a, an image of the attic uh, of the main house, the 1763 portion. Um, it is believed that this house originally had a tiled roof, and uh, we have a couple examples of tiles on display here today, including a, a ridge tile uh, with uh, this ridge tile with the 1763 date in it. Uh, generally speaking, uh, larger Germanic houses with tiled roofs had an incredible framing system underneath because obviously a tile roof is, is extremely heavy. Um, and uh, uh, you see some of this here. This uh, this is part of what's called a a, a truncated principal rafter. Uh, in, in, in the German, in German is called the Liebender School Trust. Uh, they'll be quizzing this later. I'll be taking notice. Uh, this is a very, very massive framework. And basically, you've got uh, three sets of these Liebender stools underneath, which uh, support purlins, which are long uh, wooden members that run from gable to gable. And then the common rafters basically lean on those purlins so that the weight of the tile roof won't cause the rafters to belly. Uh, this is a little bit of, of German over-engineering, uh, but it's a very, very impressive uh, truss system, and, uh, and it is intact on this, on this building. There are a handful of other buildings in Oli with Liegenderstuhl trusses, and uh, not many, but there are, there are, there are, there are a handful. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredible framing system, and again, I remind you again to the fact that, that these houses were built by professionals. 
And, uh, and when you're up there looking at this framework, it's, it's just, it's incredible. And it's, uh, it's, it's impressive. I will point out that uh, we believe that there would have been a second set of floorboards on, the, on these races that, that would have allowed more storage space uh, for grain or flour or other things uh, on this level. So when we talk about it, this being a double attic, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that there actually was another set of floorboards that would have been laid up top there for, for more storage. Okay, so here we have to the left this 1834 uh, edition, uh, 19th century edition, to the top, which uh, again we believe was, was put on by uh, Jacob II, right? It's Jacob II, right? <laughs> and you can see that uh, the roof line is more shallow, and uh, it's actually uh, has another uh, you know, kind of this nice uh, entryway hood. Um, it's a, a little simpler building, but yet a very comfortable house. Uh, again, uh, the, the roof line is not quite as steep as the, as the main part of the house. Incidentally, this uh, you can you can walk uh, inside the house from this apartment to the main to the main house. What typically happens when you have this type of retirement situation is that you had the old farmers right living a, a, a sort of an independent life. Right? Um, they might have even had a small kitchen, but they would have taken the main meal with their son in the main part of the house. And the main meal was generally eaten at midday. So generally speaking, you know, the old folks would have toddled over. I'm kind of getting there myself right now. And uh, would, have had, would have had the main dinner with, with, their, with the children, with the son, right? But then they still, had, they still had the independence of their own life as well. So it was very, very common to find these multi-generational situations, not only in Oli, but, but through Lancaster and Lebanon County. It was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a real tradition on Pennsylvania German farmsteads. All right, so this is a building that has often been described as the stone cat. I'm going to call it the ancillary building just because I'm up here, so I get to call it what I want. Right? <laughs> so here you're looking at a building with the center chimney, right? And the door off to the side, it looks like a house, right? And in fact, for many years, people who drove by this farm thought, oh, here is the early settler's house, right? And then the bigger house, oh, well, that's what they moved into later, right? But upon closer inspection of this building, right, uh, particularly the, the people who've been doing a lot of restoration work over the past, you know, 15 years or so, they have discovered that, in fact, this building probably was built about the same time or later than the larger house. Um, and it, I call it an ancillary building because it, it, it had a new number of different functions, right? Part of the spring actually flows through this bottom of the house. And there was a fireplace down here, but that fireplace was probably used for you know, food processing or other farm preparations. Um, the upper level of the barn, however, was a place where either uh, family or laborers could live. So the upper portion of the house what is in fact laid out as a three-room center chimney domestic space, but the lower level was used for different kinds of things. Now, some people might say, oh, well, it's a summer kitchen. Um, maybe. Uh, I think the idea of, of cooking in the hot weather was something which was more of a 19th century, maybe even late 19th century tradition. In the 18th century, you cooked in the kuka year round, right? Uh, and so maybe by Maybe by the 19th or uh, late 19th century, maybe they were doing some cooking in here, but it was probably originally used for various food processing and things like that. Things you didn't want to do, rendering and things that you didn't want to do in your main kitchen. Do you want to pluck the kitchen? You pluck the chicken in it? Probably not. But various uh, things could happen down in this lower level, but the upper level was used as a dwelling space for other laborers who worked on the farm or even family or what, what have you. 
Now, um, there, there's, there's some thought that this building may date as late as 1810. That's a date that's been labeled. For my own, and now, now I'm editorializing, so this is Jim Lewis talking, talking now, okay? I believe this building is earlier. Uh, I believe it's more contemporary with the main house. So I would actually, I would say this is closer to 1770, 1810. Um, I, I, I think, I, I know no buildings in the Ole Valley that post-date 1800 that are center chimney. Um, remember assimilation? By the late 18th century, um, the, 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 the people who were living in Oli were actually not, they were, they were gravitating away from that center chimney Germanic floor plan. Um, so I'm just going to leave it at that. I believe this building is, what, is a little earlier than 1810 uh, and, and was probably built, in fact, by Jacob I. Uh, but nonetheless, very, very important building on this farmstead. And um, you, see, you see how it ties into the neighboring uh, spring house. In fact, the spring kind of comes in here, flows between the two, and through the spring house and then, and then out. But I mean, this is a very important building for various farm processing and it also housed uh, laborers, I believe, uh, or family members as well. So this is the back of the ancillary building, and you can see where there's a separate entryway to that second level, you know, where, where someone lived. You know, again, whether they were laborers or other, another family member, uh, it's really a great structure. And, and the, 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 the proportions are really that of, of an 18th century Germanic building. Uh, and again, it, it has uh, multiple functions. Uh, another great building in Oli that that has multiple functions is the, is the ancillary building at the Kime House, which was a workshop, it was a food processing building, there was a bake oven in it, 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 it was all kinds of things, it was food storage, and this is in that in the, kind of that same vein, a building used for lots of different things, but clearly, I, mean, I believe it's clearly an 18th century structure, great, a great, great, great building. Is there an attic in it? Yes, there is an attic up here as well, yes, there is a loft or an attic above, yes, which is taking the court. Well, I think it was, uh, I, I think, I don't, I don't know. I don't know that that was the sleeping quarter. I think the sleeping quarter was, was in here. You know, on a bright day, I noticed I was back there at that third level, uh, the gable end. Up here? It looked different from the Yes, back. yeah, I agree. I, I, I have seen that as well. And I think that's just the process of, as the stone masons were working, perhaps they, perhaps they ran out of stone from one quarry and, and, and moved to another. Uh, or, or I, I, think, I think that has to do more with the supply of the material than anything else. I don't think it was, a, it was torn down at one point or rebuilt it, but I, I, I agree, George. I, I've seen that as well. And sometimes you see that on buildings, and I think that sometimes that's a matter of, of, of you know, the masons. The other thing is, is that, you know, things happen just like uh, with contractors today. My mason quit, you know? So you have to bring in somebody else. Maybe he had another supply of stone. Uh, sometimes you can actually find receipts and things like that in the, in the documents that explain some of that. Yes? Uh, why were the chimneys centered on the Roman I'm sorry? Why were the chimneys centered on the Roman Because uh, and they, were, they aren't dead centered. You know, it actually has to do with the floor plan. So the, the chimney is dependent on the fact that it was on a floor plan, uh, you, you have a, you, have a you, you, you enter and the kitchen is basically toward, towards the left. Uh, and then you have the chimney coming down and it, it opens into uh, opening, opens into the kitchen. And then behind that, there's more living space behind. Generally, there are, there are jam stoves behind. It, it has, it's really more of a cultural thing. Uh, English houses, it's more common for English houses to have gable fireplaces. Um, and it, it, they were really following, they were following a floor plan that they that they knew in Europe, and and, and it was really more of a kind of a, a cultural tradition than anything else. Is there another question? My uncle lived farm there in the 30s and 40s, uh -huh. and there was a beautiful wall around that spring in the front there, 
uh, a wall about so high, it's nice cement, you could easily sit on that. We had picnics down there, <laughs> and that building was used for the wash house to do the laundry. Okay. And then in the winter time, they used it for butchering uh -huh. the hogs and yep. hang the hogs up, and yep. whatever. That's, that's, that's great, that's a great oral history. And, and yeah, I, I, and wash house is another thing that you know, could be used for, could be used for washing them. And the wash house in the 18th century as well. Okay, here's the uh, spring house, and this is actually kind of looking, from, you're kind of standing next to the ancillary building, looking towards Coffin Road. So this is kind of the back of the uh, spring house. And you can see the, the spring kind of flows through this area here, and then uh, into, the, uh, into, the, into the spring house. And uh, this was uh, traditionally known as the trout pond. Where's the, were there were there trout in that in that area when you were there? Lots of lots of trout. Cool. Big ones. <laughs> cool. I don't there, know how early that practice started, but yes. There was a ram across the road that pumped yes. the water up, and then yes. next to the house, that's the only way they, they got the water to run. Yes. Well, that's going to be on the next picture. Yeah. And that pumped, that was joined from the water that yeah. came from the spring that yes. got pumped up then. Yep. So, uh, in the spring house, uh, you know, as far as when did the spring house go on the spring house build, I suspect that this was also part of the kind of the building episodes from the 1760s. And let, I wouldn't be surprised if this was also built by Jacob the first. Of course, spring houses uh, were used for storing various perishables, yeah, yeah, uh, dairy yeah. products, wooden cheese, butter, things like that. Uh, this is a very, very large building. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, a farm of the size of was putting away significant uh, amounts of those parents who needed that to keep those things cool. That's where I, I do not, and that's maybe some of the documentation we can look at. Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's Unless you find receipts uh, or day books, sometimes you lose track. And, and I, let me, let me, let me say, say something that's kind of interesting. You know, again, we know a lot about the 18th century, right? So here's a gentleman, Dan Berg, okay? So if Dan Berg wasn't born here in the 18th century, let's say, let's say he came into Philadelphia as an indentured servant. And let's say he came up and uh, was hired at a farm up here, or brought up here as a farm to work his indenture off. And let's say he never voted, you know, he never married here, he never had children, he never went to church, <laughs> he never did anything like that. He just kind of did his, he just kind of worked, you know, at the farm. And after his six or seven years, he decided to go to Maryland, where a lot of other Germans were going down to the Shenandoah Valley. And he left, right? There may be zero record that Danberg lived in the Oli Valley. And, and there's a whole group of people who were transitory and, and whose existence we don't even know, right? Um, looking through the uh, some Kime family documents, uh, inventory, in fact. I came across a, 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 a record. No, it wasn't. It wasn't the Kine family stuff. It was another. It was another. Uh, it was. It was. A, it was a 1750 document from Exeter Township. It was a. It was a. Uh, an inventory of a person's estate, and attached to it was the record of the sale or the vendue, as they called it, and it was a list of the things they sold. So first of all, they start out like, with that. okay, one harrow sold to George Miser for two shillings, right? You know, one this sold to Dan Berg for so-and-so. And as I was looking at the names, there were two or three names, where you have to study enough of this, you recognize the names. And I was like, I don't recognize those names. And it occurred to me that those people could have been people of that transitory nature who never were documented any place else except 
they went to that sale and their name was written down. And that might be the only place where their name was written here in Pennsylvania before they moved, moved on. At any rate, I think come across records where both David and his son Jacob each had at least one that sort of Uh huh. That's great. And that was and that that was not uncommon because it was a it was a labor force. It was a labor force. Yes, indeed. Indentured servants. An indenture is a contract. So uh, you know if, if, if and they were generally young people who didn't come as families. It was a young person who wanted to come to Pennsylvania, didn't, couldn't afford ship's passage. So he goes on the ship, and he owes, now he owes the, his ship's passage to the shipmaster, right? Well, the ship arrives in Philadelphia. He can't get off the ship yet until the shipmaster signs over that contract to a farmer from Oli or someplace else, right? And then you have, then, then, and then that person, that passenger, had to work off that a certain amount of time to work off that debt. So it was, he was, it was, a, it was a contract or an indenture. Uh, so at any rate, so here is actually looking towards the uh, the, the ancillary building and the spring house, and the spring kind of flows, as you can see, towards Kaufman Road. <coughs> Do you like some water, Ma'am? Got some? Okay. I need I need some water. <laughs> so this is what you were talking about, sir, right? Yep. This is uh, this uh, how's the ramp pump. And this is the spring that flows under Kaufman Road, but there would have been a ramp pump in here that would have used the, the flow of the water. It was a mechanical device that used the flow, of the, the flow of the water powered the pump, but some of that water would have risen up to a higher elevation, either to the house or to a barn or what have you. It was a way of mechanically raising the, the water from the creek or a spring or whatever to a higher elevation. So this building housed one of those ramp pumps. And this is the uh, this is the stream, and this is the stream that kind of, kind of flows down through that meadow. And you can't really see it really closely, but when you look close here, you can actually see fragments of pottery and shards of pottery and what have you that would have been washed down, you know, from the spring house. Now, how many of those indentured servants dropped things? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Go ahead and kick it, kick the shards into the spring, and down it goes. So you can actually see shards of. 18th and 19th century pottery uh, in this uh, in this waterway flowing down through the meadow. Well, there's a bake oven on this property as well, uh, and apparently, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I think I caught you with my uh, laser. But <laughs> I didn't want to, wasn't trying to blind you there. Uh, 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 it's uh, it's possible that there might have been an earlier bake oven built by David Kaufman, and that this is a replacement. Uh, I believe that this is uh, possibly uh, a mid to late 18th century building. Uh, and I, again, I wouldn't be surprised if this building was built about the same time as the main house. This is what the uh, building looks like today. And opening the door, looking it in, here's the, you know, the opening for the oven. In it, and there's a, uh, a, a domed, a brick domed oven in there, a traditional bread oven. So it's a great survival uh, from uh, the 18th to early 19th century. This uh, outbuilding stands behind the main house. It's kind of tied into the garden wall. And uh, we know that there was a blacksmith shop on this site, which likely stood uh, away from this building. And I think there's some, uh, some archaeological remains of that building. Uh, for years, I thought this was the blacksmith shop, but apparently I was incorrect. But we don't really know what this building was used for. Uh, there's a fireplace, and there were, or rather there's a chimney. So it's at actual use. Uh, is, is a little bit unknown, you know. Was it was was there, you know, was it was this the wash house? Uh, was there some other trade being practiced on this site? I don't frankly know, uh, but it, it, I think it's the, the roof line that appears to be an 18th or very early 19th century structure, and it is tied into this garden wall. So it's a very interesting building, the use of which uh, a little a little bit unknown at this point. Oops. 
<laughs> yes. So this is this garden wall, uh, and you know it's another one of those really great features on this farmstead uh, that you often don't see. Uh, and this is that building uh, which we're never really sure what it was used for. There you can see the chimney stack in the, in the corner, uh, and uh, how it ties into the, to the garden wall. And looking back towards the, these other outbuildings, the bake oven, the ancillary building, the spring house. <coughs> yes, everybody knows what the uh, this outbuildings located in, in the privy, and uh, you know one of the great things. I mean, how many privies exist? Right? These are some of the these buildings that just don't survive. Um, when was this privy built? I have no idea. You know, some people say it might be in the late 18th, early 19th century. It could have been 1930. Right? You know, privies were those buildings that you moved around for obvious reasons, you know? <laughs> Time to move the privy. Uh, but it's a great, it's just a, a really fantastic survival. You know, it's one of those things that, if you drive around the Only Valley, how many privies do you see? That many. I bet you can count them up one hand, right? Uh, so we, we have one. <laughs> and um, this is the foundation of, I believe this is the foundation of, a, of an early smokehouse. Uh, that was excavated. Uh, and as you can see, it's adjacent to the ancillary building in the, in the spring house. The smoke house is probably one of those major buildings that does not exist uh, on site. Okay, so across Kaufman Road is this barn. And uh, this may be the only structure that, that, that dates from the David Kaufman era. Uh, it's very likely that this was originally stoned down below and log up top. Uh, but there was a fire. Again, this is, uh, this is, this is looking uh, west, right? And this is the east kind of facade. This is looking east, and this is the west facade. Is that clear? <laughs> anyway, uh, it's very likely that there was a log superstructure on top of the stone foundation. Uh, and I don't know much more about this building. Uh, I don't believe that there's much original fabric inside. Uh, I believe the fire was about 1891 or something like that. So it was built and it was, it was burned and rebuilt uh, late 19th, very early 20th century. But uh, it is a, a early survival, we believe, at least the, the stone portion from the David Kaufman era. And you know, um, when we talk about grain farming, um, you don't have the requirement of, of, of the large barn for grain farming than you that you would for a dairy farm because you have fewer animals, right? You have a few draft animals, uh, but uh, you don't have large herds of dairy cattle, and so the barns associated with the earlier farms tended to, tended to be much much smaller. But again. This is only one building. There may have been numerous other smaller structures that stood in the David Kaufman era. But they needed chicken houses. They needed a pig pen, pig stock, somewhere. Yes, yes. Let me go back. I think I hit it. Yeah. All right, here we go. So now we have gone down Kaufman Road East, right? And, and, and these two barns which are pretty much landmark buildings. If you're familiar with the farm, these are pretty much landmark buildings. Uh, and now I'm going to do a little editorializing because I've seen uh, that this particular barn uh, was listed as having dated from 1732. I can tell you that that is not when this house, this building was built. So um, about, maybe it was about six years ago or so, I had the opportunity to go through these barns with a guy named Bob Ensminger. How many people in the here know the name Bob Ensminger, right? Well, he's quite a character. Dr. Robert Ensminger was an incredible barn scholar. And he was, and he's still around, but just, just an incredible guy. And, uh, and we went through these barns, both of these barns, and I said, Bob, what do you think about the date of these two barns? Well, I always considered this barn much earlier in this part a little bit later, right? So Bob's there. I really think that these two barns are almost contemporary. 
They might have been built within a few years, but I believe that they're both 1830s, maybe 1820s at the earliest. Um, and when you really look at these two buildings now, next to one another, you can see the roof line is very consistent. Actually, the fenestration is very similar. But the other thing about it is look at the four bay, right? The four bay is not a cantilever four bay. It's more of an, this is the kind of four bay that you find on what's called the Pennsylvania Standard Barn. It's more of an indentation, right? And these walls, okay, are symmetrical. Now, if you look at the earliest barns, and there are a couple of early ones in the Ole Valley, like the one in Jim Coker's farm, which has a cantilevered forebay. So with a cantilevered forebay, the roofs are not symmetrical. Right? This roof extends down as the cantilever comes out. Right? But you have a symmetrical roof line for both these buildings. And I, and I really believe that Bob was correct, that both these barns were built maybe as late as the 1830s. And I think of, of Jacob the second, and all the building that he was doing, building the other farm down the road for Isaac, and, 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 and perhaps building these two at the same time. And when you think about the 1830s, that is precisely the time that a lot of the agricultural economy in Ole was moving from grain to dairy. And a lot of things were happening in the 1830s and 1840s. I have to say that, you know, when I was at the Boone Homestead, I was living in the 18th century, right? <laughs> well, when I went to Landis Valley Museum, I started living in the 19th century because Landis Valley is largely a 19th century story. And I began becoming a lot more fascinated with the 1830s and 1840 period of time. And it was a really pivotal time in our nation's history. It was really, that was really the time when technology was changing. You consider the railroads being built during that period of time. Telegraph, photography, right? Uh, and it was a time that allowed the urban areas to expand and to grow. And as the urban areas expanded, that, that, that created a demand for dairy goods. And, and, and you also then started with the capability of shipping dairy goods to cities like Reading or even Philadelphia. And, and you saw an expansion of dairy farming and that's when the agriculture really changed. So it's very, I think it's very possible that both of these buildings were part of Jacob II's building episodes uh, during this very period of time. Bob Ensminger felt that this barn was probably for horses, and that this was, of course, the dairy barn. But the, the larger barn behind is a bank barn. This barn out front is a ground barn, so it is not built into a bank. So here's some other views of this the barn that's closer to the road. Again, another view of the front of this barn. And the gable view. Right, so this is actually the east gable. And you can see the kind of the symmetrical uh, arrangement of the windows with, with movers. And again, you get a sense of this four bay, but again, it's more of an indentation. It's the kind of four bay you find on the standard barn as it's called. There's also a water trough there. There's a water trough there. This is actually cement, but I wonder if it's uh, stone underneath that's been cemented over. But there's a water trough there. This is the back of that horn. And, and, and of course, this, this facade really, really looks early. Uh, but you've got these, these, uh, these segmented stone doorways. Uh, and here you can see that this barn it's not a bank barn, it's a ground barn. Right? And, and so you've got you've to gotta get your hay up here. Um, I will say that one other thing about this barn is that I only was able to actually get up into the loft uh, about a couple months ago and look at the framing of this barn. And the roof framing of this barn is very consistent with mid 19th century fruit roof framing. It is nothing out of the ordinary. You've got you know, standard rafters and purlins and some queen posts, but it's a very standard 19th century uh, framing. Uh, had this been a barn that, that predated 1800, I would have expected to find a different kind of framing. Either Levender School trusses 
or even an English principal reactor system. But uh, the, 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 the blue framing is very consistent with being a 19th century barn. So here's a, the interior of the smaller barn. Again, just seeing the, uh, uh, the, 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 the segmented arches. And, uh, and you've, got the, uh, you know, you've got these areas with, on each gable end where you could have had the harness and tack and things like that uh, posted. Yes, you could. <laughs> so the other great thing about this barn is that it has a, a sprinkle bar, right? So here's a, this wooden bar, uh, and you can slide it over, as I have partly slid here, into the stone wall, right? So you can actually open top and bottom door, pull this bar across, and your horse won't get out. So here's a funny story. Uh, we were walking through this barn, might have been over the summer, we were doing a tour, and we were kind of walking around, and I said, ah, oh, sprinkle bar. And I took this bar and slid it over, and it disappeared into the pockets. And they're like, oh, no, what did I do? And then I looked closer, and the iron wings was still attached. So I was able to pull it out. But you know, this bar was inserted the day that they built this stone wall, in whatever year it was, you know. Uh, it hasn't been out since then, and, and the only way to get it out is by cutting it in half. But uh, it, it was, I, was, I, was saved. I was saved when I saw this in the barn. Incidentally, you know, you think about whether this barn was used for horses or for, or for cattle, and you know the phrase, as dumb as an ox? Uh, it's a funny story, when I was in Landis Valley, we had three oxen, and uh, they were kind of old, and they all had their horns. And they weren't, we weren't, weren't driving them anymore, but they were in a pasture that had a wooden fence. Uh, it was mainly a, a, most of the fence was kind of a snake fence, right? And the oldest ox named Lad, particularly when the apples were out on the orchard, could dismantle the fence with his horns and get out. And I think maybe, um, I think maybe an ox could actually slide that sprugle bar over. I don't think a horse is quite smart enough to do that. I'm sorry, horse fans. But um, I've been counting some smart oxen, actually. They probably would have gotten out of this barn. Anyway, the sprugle bar is a great uh, little detail. All right, so here is the larger dairy barn uh, that sets up behind and uh, has the same type of, of four bay as the smaller barn, and pretty much the same roof line. They're very, very similar. Uh, and of course, this would have been you know, a very, very large dairy barn for, for a dairy cow. And of course, if you're going to have a large dairy herd year round, you also have to have a lot of space for hay, right? Because you're feeding all of these animals you know, over the winter. And so uh, the, the, the huge area up top uh, not only for threshing floors but all, and work, but also for, for hay storage. Here's the back of this dairy barn. You get a sense again of the arrangement of the windows, symmetrically arranged, kind of the way you found on the smaller barn. And here's the bank in the back, uh, and a double threshing floor with a granary off the back as well, in this large barn. And uh, looking, this is the inside of that large barn, looking at the double uh, threshing floor. And just imagine this whole area filled with hay, you know. Uh, but you get a sense of the roof framing. And again, this is very, very common uh, mid-19th century roof framing with common rafters. And you've got, this is the purlin running from gable to gable. And then these are supported by these queen posts that are braced against these cross members. Um, so it's a, it's a relatively light roofing. This would have been for a wooden shingle roof, you know, uh, but uh, very large bar, a lot of space. Uh, incidentally, uh, there, are, there are people who buy these barns and use them for different things. And uh, uh, if you ever in that situation, <laughs> you know, a lot of people think that, oh, we, we can just, 
you can just maybe open this space by start removing some of this stuff. <laughs> um, these are, by the time you got into the mid-19th century, these, these Dutchmen figured out that you don't need to over-engineer, right? And so you can't move, you can't remove too many of these pieces before the thing like wants to fall down. So you gotta be really, really careful about the framing in these big, huge barns, but really large, great example of a, of a I think a mid-19th century, 1830s or 40s uh, dairy barn. <coughs> you know where that happened? People taking that out, and the first heavy wet snow come, yes. the roof dries, yes. and they wonder why. Yes, exactly right, exactly right. You know, you can do that, you know, some, again, there's some, I've seen some 18th century framing which was over-engineered, but by the time you get into the 19th century, it's, <laughs> it was there for a reason. So, between the barns and the early part of the, of the farmstead, you have a, a grouping of agricultural buildings in a row here. Um, and the date is somewhat in question, so most likely the 19th century building. Uh, you've got this, this wooden stable building, pig side, and a corn crib wagon shed. Uh, and these, you know, let's we'll, we'll, we'll go one by one. Um, all right, so this is the back of that uh, wooden stable building. And it, this, this building was some type of agricultural building. Did it house sheep? Did it house some other animals? Did it house heifers? I'm not really sure. You know, I don't know. We don't know yet. Uh, it has a wooden floor inside, and it is a it is a frame <coughs> building. It is a timber frame building, uh, clad with wooden siding. But here we have, and this has been a restored. This is a new roof that was put on the way the old one was, which was found here. These are the side lot shingles. We have, a, we have one of the original side lap shingles on display here today. So uh, German, German tradesmen who arrived in the mid-18th century came with certain uh, ways of, of doing things in the building, right? And, and were peculiar to English ways of doing things, right? <laughs> so one of the peculiar German uh, ways of doing things was to put wooden shingle roofs on buildings. They put wooden shingles on that were lapped, in addition to being lapped the ordinary way, they were lapped sideways. And, you can, and, you, and, and they were lapped in such a way that uh, you have straight courses from bottom to top. See how these are straight? Straight line, right? Uh, now, in the 18th century, these were also long shingles. Uh, when uh, I was in charge of the Boone Homestead and we decided to reshingle the Berkeley Log House, we looked at the nailing pattern on the rafters and determined because of the lathing spacing that that house originally had German long shingles. Those shingles were 36 inches long, but only a third of that is exposed, right? So yeah, it was 36 inches, but it was a 12 inch exposure. Uh, but because of the lapping both sideways and lengthwise, and because of the length of the, of the shingles, at every spot of that roof, you had three layers of wood. Right? So at any rate, uh, these shingles are, are tapered sideways. They're tapered actually both ways, as if it's a very... Uh, Building the, making these shingles is a, you have to know what you're doing. <laughs> but it creates a roof of a distinctive type. And when uh, the restoration was done in this building, they, they actually found the original side lap roof under, was it a metal roof, maybe a tin roof? Uh, and underneath was this, was the original side lap. And so they recreated these side lap German shingles on this building. Now, the people who were studying this and, and did the restoration found that a lot of the, shing the shingles were actually affixed with, with cut nails. And, 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 and they found and they, 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 they believed that because of that, um, this building maybe wasn't, wasn't built until maybe the 1840s or 50s. And that's possible. That's possible. Uh, 
I'm going to throw out an editorial comment <laughs> that I believe this building proportionally looks earlier. Uh, when you have this kind of a steep roof, and if you look at the relationship of the distance between the peak of the roof to the eave of the roof is the same distance as the eave to the ground. That one-to-one -one relationship, that is, that is usually associated with an earlier building. Right? Uh, I'm not so sure, it's, it's possible that this building was built in the 1840s or 50s. I think it's possible that this building may have been moved here as well in the 1840s or 50s from some other location. I don't think we should rule that out. Because you know what? People did that a lot in the 18th and 19th century. They bought buildings and took them apart. Well, they didn't. They had the house right to do that. But they bought buildings and took them apart and moved them elsewhere. Um, does everybody know where the, uh, uh, the Greasemer Stone House is on the corner of Old Turnpike Road and 662? Right? So there's a, there's a, it's a, it's a white stone mason, the masonry building. And behind that building is a little stone building with the same roof line in proportion as this. And it's almost an identical building, except it's limestone. I believe that's also an agricultural building. I, 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 just have, I just have a I have this gut feeling that this building dates late 18th century. But I could be wrong. You know? But that's, you know, the fun thing about this is that, you know, you can have opinions and you can base it on evidence. Um, and, uh, and, and you do a little more research. But this is a great surviving building. Uh, J. Edwin Brumbaugh thought this was an 18th century building when, when he drove by, but I think because of the, of the proportion and the form and everything, uh, and I don't think he knew that there were, there were cut nails used as a roof at that time. But then here. It was such an early building, maybe that's one of the three shingles. Well, you know, it's, it's possible. Now, one of the things I will say, uh, Side lap, even though this was an 18th, side lap shingles was an 18th century way of doing it, but this way of shingling persisted into the, into the mid 19th century. And you know, what's really cool is that uh, at both, after the Battle of Gettysburg and the Battle of Antietam, photo photographers went to the battlefield and photographed the battlefield and the buildings on the field of battle, right? At both Gettysburg, and at Antietam. Now, Antietam was fought in Maryland in a town called Sharpsburg, right? What does that have to do with us? Well, Sharpsburg was settled by Pennsylvania Germans from Berks, Lebanon, and Lancaster County. And if you look at photographs of Sharpsburg in 1862, it is a Pennsylvania German town of center chimney log houses. And there's the Dunker Church, right? Uh, and all the names are Pennsylvania German. And when you look at the photographs, there are photographs of four different buildings from the Battle of Antietam, which show side lap roofs. And in fact, you know, the bridges at Antietam were major parts of the, of the battle. Well, those bridges, there were three bridges at, at Sharpsburg at, during the Battle of Antietam. They all have a stone um, abutment walls, and each of those stone abutment walls are coped with German side lap shingles. So side lap shingles were being used in Sharpsburg in the mid 19th century. There's also at least one building photographed after the Battle of Gettysburg in the side lap roof as well. So this was being used. This, Germans were using this method to shingle roofs in the in the mid 19th century. Were those shingles made of white oak? Um, we believe that in the 18th and early 19th century, they used a type of oak called shingle oak, which no longer exists today. The oak that is closest to that is red oak. So today when we put uh, side lap shingles and we put side lap shingles on the Birdlip Log House, we've also done uh, the buildings at the Airford Cloister. When I say we, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, like my former employer. <laughs> uh, uh, and two buildings at Landis Valley. Uh, when we've done side lap roofs in those places, we've used red oak shingles, which is the closest to shingle oak. Left or right for any particular it usually is, it, it, it tends to be lapped where the dominant wind comes from. So I think the one in Oli is lapped so that wind coming from the west uh, will not get under it. 
The unfortunate thing about it is that it went from the, it went from the east, usually brings rain. So, uh, and I, I, I have to double check, I'm not sure, actually. But usually, the, you know, an east wind usually brings rain around here. Uh, but they might be laughed the opposite way. In that, but I haven't checked that. I'm not, not exactly sure. So here's the pigsty. Uh, pigsty is probably, a, you know, it could be mid to late 19th century building. Um, and so it's one of those buildings which are which just the, the pigsties are, are, are not existing any longer. The traditional pigsties are disappearing from the landscape. So the fact that we have one here is, is, just, is just great. I, I am, by the way, nearing the end for anybody who is uh, thinking about when the hell is this guy going to stop. <laughs> so there, there are two more uh, agricultural buildings. We have the uh, corn crib and, and wagon shed. Uh, and uh, you know, I don't know when this building was, was constructed. You know, again, any, any kind of like the pig stock could be mid to late 19th century. Um, what sometimes happens with these wagon sheds is that uh, Sometimes you can see evidence where wagon beds were, were lifted off of the running gear. Uh, I have not seen that here in this building, and I don't know if that existed. And I don't know how common that was in the Ole Valley, to be honest with you. Uh, you can certainly find it in, in Lancaster and Lebanon. I don't know if there are examples in, in the Ole Valley uh, where, where they, you can see where they would raise the, the wagon beds off of the running gear. And maybe it happened, but uh, I, don't, I didn't see the evidence of that here. And then this building, which is kind of known as the chicken house. Um, and what's interesting about it is that it was built on an earlier stone foundation. Right? It's possible that there might have been some other building on top of that foundation pre-chicken house. I don't know. Uh, the chicken house could be almost anywhere from 1860 to 1950. Uh, it could be almost anything, but it's, I'm glad we have it. The coin grid. What's the number of salt from? Surface salt or up or down salt? I don't know. I don't know, but here's, but here's the thing. You have to be careful about that. Because right down the road, a mile from this farm, there was a water-powered, up-and-down sawmill that ran through World War II. And that's the, that's the Burblet Sawmill, which has been moved to the Danigan Homestead. So there is wood in the Ole Valley cut in the mid-20th century of an up and down mill that ordinarily you, you'd associate with the 18th century. So you have to be careful about, about that. I don't know how that wood is cut, but again, you have to be careful because of Bertlett Mill just down the road was, uh, was, was an, up, an 18th century mill used until the 20th century. Okay, so just a couple, a couple views of the Isaac Kaufman farm just down the road. Okay, so this is the main, this is the view from the, uh, I hope the Peter's Himes don't mind because I actually walked over their property to take these pictures a couple months ago. <laughs> I usually knock first, but anyway, sorry. So a view from the road, and, uh, and, here's, a, and here's the main house, and there actually is a date down here that says uh, Jacob and Susanna Kaufman, uh, 1832. Uh, and what's interesting about this building is that it is not a century Germanic house because by this period of time, the prosperous Germans of the Ole Valley are building center hall, four square Georgian houses. In fact, by, by the 1780s, prosperous Germans in the Ole Valley were building center hall, four square Georgian houses. They abandoned their traditional German three-room floor plan house very, very soon. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why you had this happen in Ole was because Philadelphia was their market. They were going to Philadelphia. Uh, everything from in the Ole Valley was Philadelphia oriented. And, and uh, uh, certainly in the 18th century, they came in touch with this type of, of new architecture and it became more fashionable. And very soon, uh, these prosperous Germans uh, were embracing this architecture. Also, two things. They did take up near the space in the house. Yes. And so we're coming in. Right. And, and you're right. There are a lot of other things happening. And, and, and really, when you look at the evolution of German floor plans, the first thing that went, like a generation after the first settler, was, was, was that subsequent houses 
did not use the center chimney. They may have included the three room floor plan, but they moved their fireplaces to gable end because they did take up a lot of floor space. You're absolutely right. So, um, and this is just some of the other agricultural buildings at the, uh, at the Isaac Kaufman Farm uh, adjoining. Um, I have not gone through these buildings. I, I haven't researched this farm at all. I think that if we look at this barn and looked at the barn on the other Kaufman Farm, the large dairy barn, I think we would find that they were very, very similar. And I wouldn't be surprised that maybe they were built by the same house right or the same barn barn right. Uh, because I think that they are they were again, you know, I think they are probably built within a few years of each other and are, are, are very, very similar structure. Again, this is the adjoining uh, Isaac, Isaac Coffin Farm just up the road. Yay! He's done! He's done! <laughs> so, are there any other questions about anything? Where's my house? Is there any indication that there were shutters on the windows? Um, I don't remember seeing anything. Jim, could you repeat the question? Whether there are shutters on the main house. Yeah. There, there are uh, pintles for that. There are there, are there. On all the levels or just the ground floor? I thought, I, I, I recall seeing them on upper levels. Okay. Um, the idea of shutters is not all houses have shutters. And in rural areas, it's more common for shutters to be found on the ground floor, but not the second floor, because shutters were not storm windows. Shutters were for privacy. And so if you're in the second floor and you're in the middle of the Old Way Valley, who's going to be looking in your windows, right? <laughs> um, but in the cities, they had shutters in all, in all of these. But uh, that isn't always hard and fast, but <coughs> Yes. And that can explain those cut down. Yes, yes. Yep. Good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, yes, I think there is. Yes, there is. I would say. I, I would say that at this point, you probably, I, 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 cannot, I cannot give you the name of a house right or a builder who lived in Old, but they existed. And I think that when you look at a, a groupings of buildings like the Kaufman Farm and the, the Levan House and the Kime House and, and, and some others, the, the Beneville House, which all built you know, within a decade or two, I think there probably were common hands, but we have not yet done the research on those buildings to the detail that you can say, okay, this is the hand of this person, or that's the hand of that person. I think, yes, I think there are probably only so many builders, and and, and I think in some areas in Pennsylvania, and I'm not just saying that, just, even just with German builders, but in Philadelphia and Chester County, there have been areas where there has been study on buildings where they have been able to find that, yes, here's a whole set of buildings that obviously were built by the same person. Mm -hmm. That hasn't been done in Holy yet, but I think that if we did, yes, I think we would find a common hand uh, for, for domestic architecture as well as barns and other buildings. And we, we haven't done that yet. Um, you know, I think that um, there is... <coughs> There's a, a tremendous amount of research that can be done on all of these buildings and all of them. And, um, and I would love to see more done, like, like, like what we just mentioned, looking, looking for that common, looking for that, those common hands. We just, we just don't even know what the relationship was between uh, an owner and, a, and, and, let's say, a housewife or the lead house. We don't even know that. We don't even, we're not even sure. Um, I know that, the, does everybody know Alan Kaiser, who's a, a well-known? You know, Alan Kaiser owns, I believe, what he believes is an early contract between a builder and a housewife. And I think it relates to a building in Muhlenberg Township. Uh, but so many of those just don't exist. Uh, and so some of that, 
document, documentation just is gone. In our farm, our barn was supposed to be built in 1846. On some of the fence at the joints, there was Roman numerals, mm -hmm. chisel in, and some of them have little initials cut in two of the chisel. Really? Really? So that's probably the guy that was working on that joint. Yes. Yes. And you, you know, look close. A get up close to some of these old barns. You'll find that in there. And a lot of the joints, you can still see the pencil mark the hump where they inscribed it. Or they took an awl and scribed it yep. shot in the way before they cut. There actually is, I, I think that, I think it was, I think it was one of the, <clears throat> one of the barns here at, at Coffin. Because um, it was the same day that the Bob Ezmir and I were walking around. And I think it's in one of, one of the boards of the large dairy barn in the upper level. Um, there is, like a guy took either an awl, right? And, and was drawing a framework. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't necessarily the frame for work for that barn. Bob thought, that might have been a house right diagramming to a prospective customer how he would frame his building. I haven't gone back to look for that, but I believe that exists at one of the We're just going to take one more yeah. question, uh, and then if you have other questions for Jim, you can. And then you can come up and take a look at the stuff, too. I wanted to mention the building in Denton. Yes. Yes. The dining pick of Nord and one of Kaiser's relatives was also involved in the building in Denton. Told that day. How about that? Yeah. So do you have some names? Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy some.